having teams that can shoot free throws real well. You remember Mac, uh, how, well, how well his team shot at Ohio State several times. They took Hawkeyes right out of a game, free throw shooting. And I say that, and he misses the front end of the one and one. Only Cox, the second chance of the year at the line. As a team, you and I shooting 72% from the line. And now Webb is in the game for the first time for the Hawks. What's Tom Davis looking out of him right now, man? Well, I think right now he's trying to get some activity again out of Jay Webb. Trying to get some points and offensive rebounds. Jay was very effective at UNLV coming in, giving the Hawkeyes a little spark. Webb loses the basketball. It's Mullenberg. Two on one. Pulls up, pops it, drains it. He got a high dribble, but he got into his rhythm again and was able to get the jumper off as Iowa just didn't come back offensively or defensively. Right now, this team is deficient in really having a good quarter court scoring team. And it'll go over to the Panthers. Brad Hill anticipated the pass, bolted out in front of Ingram, and the ball was thrown away. Les Jepson quickly back into the lineup. Iowa with 13 first half turnovers. Three more substitutions come in. That gives Iowa almost 30 substitutions in this first half already with 2.48 to go. A lot of fresh bodies. A lot of them rotating in and out. And, of course, that's Tom Davis' philosophy. We saw Les Jepson making sure they had enough bodies on the floor because he was counting them there. <laughs> you get 10 yards with six on the, <laughs> on the floor. Johnson will pull up and take that jumper for the first time. This is it. Hill inside to Reese. Won't go, but he's fouled. Great pass inside. Tremendous pass by the J.C. transfer out of Michigan. And Reese having a little bit of trouble hitting the shot inside, but he is going to go to the free throw line. Jason Reese with just four points. Seems like he's been more active in the offense, but only four points here in the first half. He hit his first two baskets, then he's missed his next five. Of course, that shot does not count since it did not go and he got fouled. They're scoring most of the points on the transition game and pull-up jumpers. It's not been the inside work. Jason Reese, one of the better free throw shooters on this team, 76.5%. He's their scoring leader, 22.7. But Turner, Fife, Merlinburg, McCullough on any given night, as we have seen, can't put the ball in the hoop. As you can see in the background, Tom Davis talking to Troy Skinner. Now Skinner will have to go down steps and out about eight feet to the bench. Back up to a nine-point lead, Bob. 2.30, left to play in the first half. Panthers would love to take a double-digit lead into the locker room. That's Garner on the point. Off the pick by Jepson, back to the big guy. Garner has a tendency to get himself in trouble a lot, that he loves to drive and figure out who to get through. Garner drives inside, has it slapped away. And the ball is out of bounds, they'll give it to the Hawkeyes. The first time when I saw Brian Garner, I thought he was the quickest point guard I may have ever seen. The guy is so quick, but sometimes he goes beyond his ability. Good rebound that time by Mulliger. I think Thompson couldn't believe how open he was after he made the move, turning to the inside. Turner takes it all away. Call before the foul, though. Garner reaching in, trying to slap it away. And that'll put Turner at the line for the one and one. See if you can pick up Garner slapping as he goes by. Reaching right there, in. reaching in. And then Ingram taking the charge. And that's a gutsy situation to do right there when you got the knee problems that he has had. Five first half points for Dale Turner. 6'2, 193. Went to Venice High School in Illinois, just a sophomore. Started 27 of 28 games last year as a freshman. Elder Miller says he could end up being one of the best guards he has ever coached, including his time at Ohio State. Why well, would Ramsey? It's hard to believe. Troy Taylor, all those guys. This guy really has great court awareness. He has the ability to slide over to the two guard. and could just be, like you said, the very best he's ever had. His assist to turnover ratio is always up at two and a half, three to one. 11 point lead. Jepson takes loose inside for the easy two. Still, though. 40-31. Turner's in trouble, finally finds Hill. Panthers trying to break the pressure. Mullenberg gets it across. Garner reaching in. Garner's picked up two quick ones. Hawkeyes had a good double team. 
and just over anxiousness. That time on Brian Garner's part, lifted a knee up, caught the side of Troy Muhlenberg. Fife coming back into the ball game again. You know, guy, he, he got a chance to take a rest. And that was a luxury there. And Reese going back to the bench. Did you expect Jason Reese going to the bench twice in the first half? Being only in the position in, where you could put him down? Only if he was in foul trouble. Yeah. Which, uh, which okay. is good news for Elton that he is not. Although the pace of the game almost dictates you have to take him out for a minute or 90 seconds at a time. Let him catch his breath, get his legs back. I think Muhlenberg may be the story here of the first half. 13 points, and he just doesn't look like he's intimidated on the floor. That, that's, that's what you, you worry about when you're playing a team that's bigger and stronger and got the reputation. Hill inside, gets hammered, no call. Jepson with the block. 124 to play, Garner driving. Looks like Cox may have picked up that foul or Cam Johnson. You know, but I really believe, Bob, that the summer league, the prime time league you have in Iowa City, about eight of the UNI players played there last summer. And, of course, it gave them a lot of confidence. They not only played against Iowa players, they played against Brad Lowhouse, Kevin Gamble, people in the NBA. All of a sudden, it elevates your self-esteem, and that's how they're playing here tonight. Les Jepson, the MVP of that league, really made his mark there, averaging 35 points, about 20 rebounds a game. You know, they're hoping that Jepson becomes a Brad Lohaus, a guy that really turns around in his four years at Iowa. And I'm not sure that he'll ever reach that stature, but uh, he has proved, improved marketedly. Isn't it amazing, though, that, that team with Horton and Armstrong and, and all the players that Tom Davis had the last couple of years, all five starters in the NBA. It's almost unheard of. That team that almost made it to the final four when they lost to UNLV, I, I know they'd love to have that second half back. <laughs> Sometimes you don't get to the final four, four though with your best athletes. Just ask Lute Olson. Rose is better than that on the second one. And fresh substitutions. Rodell Davis, Troy Skinner back in. Dale Turner also back in for the Packers. 121 left here in the first half. An exciting first half of basketball. And a sold out dome. It's been sold out for over a month. 23,000, the largest crowd ever to see an indoor game. Skinner tipped it away. Look at Thompson. He's out of control. Les Jepson. <laughs> Put the exclamation mark on the end of that where Jepson shook free. Looked like he traveled before he went up for it. Well, right? he looks like he travels a lot when he gets the basketball, to tell you the truth. And that was all made possible by the pressure. Troy Skinner stripping it, and Raymond Thompson making the one-on-one -on -one move getting defenders to come to him to free up Jepson. Under a minute now, 44 seconds to play. Mullenberg in the corner. He's got big less in his face. Back to Cox. Inside, Fife shakes loose. Can't get it to go down. Fife was guys... wide open for that shot. I don't think he knew he was that wide open. Clock. The shot clock is off now. Foul underneath. It'll go against Hill. And now both teams in the one and one. 27 seconds left. 41 35. The Hawkeyes trimming away you and I's 10 point lead. They were up by 11 at one point, so uh, they're getting back into it. I mean, if you can pull it within five at halftime, you got to be very happy with the way the first half's gone. And Jay Webb checks in for Les Jepson, protecting Les Jepson a little bit, giving him a little more rest. One thing that we haven't talked about is the fact that Iowa begins its Big Ten season this weekend against Ohio State. So they're preparing for that while UNI doesn't play a mid continent game for a couple of weeks. The company line you heard this week was, this is just another game. We're building up, but boy, it was hard for me to believe it, especially with this crowd here and excitement. Well, I really believe the coaches believed that you know, between them, they've won almost 800 games. So they've played a lot bigger game as far as meaningful and conference standings, NCAA play. But it was hard not for the, the kids, especially from Iowa, the state of Iowa, not to get involved in this. It just means so much to the UNI program. Boy, Tom Davis really going deep to his bench now. Dale Reed from the Bags, Wyoming. The freshman comes in for the last 25 seconds. I'd like to see him shoot. He stays scored 40 points a game in high school. Broke his brother's scoring record. All in the family, 15 seconds left. Just a four-point lead. Down to seven. Mullenberg will look for the shot. Off balance. 
In and out. Fife slaps it out of bounds. The Hawkeyes will have it. Tom Davis says there should be a second left on the clock. And there should be one or two. They have blown their whistle. There won't be, though. Everybody's leaving. And Tom, Tom Davis. Davis is still coming out of the court. He is hot. He's, He's keeping furious. his players on the court now as the officials are walking off. But that is it. There will not be any time put back on the clock. So after 20 minutes, it is 41-37. The Panthers on top by four. We'll be back with halftime stats. And the lottery has a big giveaway for you. So stay tuned as you're watching you and I basketball on the Iowa Television Network. The Iowa Lottery raises a lot of money for worthwhile projects, but we know that our games must be fun, too. We're making some changes for 1990. We'll be paying over 65% on our scratch games. No lottery in the country is paying more. For now, we're ending our second chance drawings. We'll devote $700,000 more in prizes to each scratch game. More dollars, more winners. It starts with Frosty the Dome Man. Remember, when you play, all Iowa wins. No matter how bad the weather gets this winter, getting places can be a lot easier when you're driving a 1990 Lincoln Continental. You won't find its combination of front-wheel drive traction and anti-lock brakes on any Mercedes or BMW. Yet with all this and Lincoln luxury, it's priced thousands less. Lincoln Continental. Now, something else not found on BMW or Mercedes. $1,000 cash back. These cancer-causing chemicals are now finding their way into the nation's milk supply. It's a disorder that soldiers used to get, but now we're seeing it in our children. Wet, sticky snow is on the way tonight, the kind that makes you grunt as you clear your driveway. Thank you. Stand by, Stand by. Stand by. Tonight's game is being sponsored by the Iowa Lottery. When you play the lottery, Iowa wins. And by Budweiser. Beachwood Age for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. And by the Lincoln Mercury Dealers Association. And Homemakers West, Iowa's largest furniture store. halftime hoopla here at the jam-packed Unidome in Cedar Falls. Mike Pace is my name, and in the next couple of minutes, we're going to give away $105,000 to five lucky Iowa Lottery players, and we're going to be telling you about how Iowa Lottery profits are helping the University of Iowa and the University of Northern Iowa in research and development. Now, over here, of course, the drum is full of entries that have been selected on a weekly basis in preliminary drawings, and our broadcast is being monitored by the independent auditing firm of McGladry and Pullen. So I say we get busy and give some money away. There's the auditors right there. What do you say? We have the help right now of Patty and Mike from the UNI Panther Cheerleader Squad. So let's get busy. And we need a $5,000 winner. Of course, if you had a scratch ticket that wasn't a winner, it might still be a winner. And here's Patty with our first winner of five grand. Patty? Jody Stenwell from Sioux City, Iowa. Jody Stenwell, Stenwall of Sioux City, Iowa. $5,000. Congratulations. And here's Mike with a $10,000 winner. Did we have a half or what here at the Unidome? What a great game. Michael. $10,000 winner, please. Robert Evans from Moline, Illinois. Moline, Illinois. Robert Evans has won $10,000. Now we're ready for, <laughs> well, they're friendly foreigners to the east. You know, now we have a $15,000 winner. And here's Patty. Merwin Hart from Davenport, Iowa. Merwin Hart from Davenport, Iowa. A $15,000 winner. Now, the next prize is for $25,000. And I have a feeling whoever wins this, it might even heal some wounds if their team doesn't win tonight. You know, Mike? Yeah, I'd say so. Who's our winner? 
Don Thompson from Ames, Iowa. From Ames, Iowa, Don Thompson has won $25,000 now. Our grand prize winner of $50,000 from the Iowa Lottery for sending in those non-winning scratch tickets. Here we go, Patty. Joel Ose from Story City. Joel Ose, I believe it's O-S-E from Story City, Iowa. Our grand prize winner of $50,000 from the Unidome and the Iowa Lottery. Wow. Now we'll be back here at the Unidome with lots more, but first, these messages. This is Breakaway Action with Beth Delagardelle. Here's a look at action coming up this week at the track following a record holiday week. A 1 o'clock Wednesday matinee is business car day, and the third qualifying rounds get underway for the Pepsi-Cola Waterloo Cup. The top eight-point finishers advance to Saturday's championship. And the matinee on Thursday is college educator and Cahawk Club day, and the disabled American veteran King Marsan, chapter number 11, will be our guest during community organization night. Every Friday matinee is Senior Citizen Day, and Friday night is Hudson Community Challenge Night, with patrons from Hudson receiving a four-for-one special. And attend our weekly seminar every Saturday at 11.30 a.m. for answers to your wagering questions, followed by our 1 o'clock matinee. Saturday evening, racing starts at 7.30, and the Pepsi-Cola Waterloo Cup will be contested, featuring Waterloo's top 516 sprinters with an added $7,500 purse, trophy, and blanket. And the pick six is over $27,000. it down, move it out. Homemakers Furniture Outlet, miscellaneous items, odds and ends, slow moving merchandise. Slash the prices, out they go. Factory overrun, special factory buyouts. A large selection of sofas, $2.99. Five piece wood dinette, $1.99. Credit is available. You won't believe the low prices or the tremendous selection. It's more than a surplus store. In Homemakers Furniture Outlet, 5035 Hubble, one and a half miles off I-80, the Midwest largest. back at the Unidome here in Cedar Falls, and I mean it is jam-packed with 23,000 fans of the, both the Panthers and the Hawkeyes, and it was a fabulous first half. And right now, some incredible entertainment from the Bud Light group here with all the fancy slam dunks and so on and so forth. But right now, I want to review our winners from the Iowa Lottery of $5,000, Jody Stenwall from Sioux City. We had a $10,000 winner from Moline, Illinois, Robert Evans. Mervyn Hart of Davenport won $15,000. Don Thompson from Ames, Iowa won $25,000. And our grand prize winner of $50,000 was Joel Osi from Story City, Iowa. And if you added up $105,000 from the Iowa Lottery tonight here at the Unidome, so send in those non-winning scratch tickets, whatever you do. Now, in addition to giving away lots of prizes, of course, the Iowa Lottery helps with research and development and job creation all over the state of Iowa. And right now, we're going to hear about how that money is helping the University of Iowa and the University of Northern Iowa. And we'll start with Dr. Rex Montgomery from the University of Iowa. Lottery dollars have had manifold benefits for the research programs at the University of Iowa. They have supported research ideas that have promise in economic development, uh, such as a computerized modeling of metal castings. We have developed sophisticated resources to support the research infrastructure, uh, such as the dynamic simulator or laser facility. And we have uh, hired superstar professors. Uh, David Gibson, for example, is involved in uh, uh, environmental research associated with the unique biocatalysis center 
Uh, this center is looking to produce value-added products, usually from agricultural materials, uh, by the use of living systems. Uh, the, the, the center is also hoping to improve uh, the environment uh, by the removal of toxic substances. The lottery dollars have also assisted us in converting some of this new information into useful purposes. Uh, we have organized, uh, using the lottery uh, dollars, a technology innovation center, which is where new ideas can be incubated uh, for businesses. Uh, so far, we have had 31 startup companies and nine of which have graduated and are very successful. Uh, we are now developing an Oakdale Research Park on 175 acres next to the Technology Innovation Center where we look for the location of future graduates of the Technology Innovation Center as well as other new businesses. At the University of Northern Iowa, we know Iowans are faced with tough decisions every day about employment, the economy, and quality of life. Fortunately for Iowa communities, businesses, and entrepreneurs, there is help available. Northern Iowa's Institute for Decision Making is a forum of experienced staff members who help develop strategic plans, marketing goals, and financial packages. The Institute is funded in part by the Iowa Lottery. During the past two years, the Institute staff has worked with over 100 communities and over 40 businesses, creating more than 2,000 new jobs, adding $30 million to the Iowa economy, and attracting Fortune 500 companies to the state. We had an unemployment rate of 11.5% in 1984. Things didn't look good in Dubuque, Iowa. Today, we have an industrial park. Our unemployment rate has dropped to 6.7%. We have just the support of the community, the positive attitude, the Institute for Decision Making has been a key to our economic development effort. The Institute for Decision Making is really that. It teaches you how to make the decisions you want to make for your community. I don't think that we would be at the point we are uh, without their help. There are some private consulting firms that do the same work and uh, I think that the report that I've seen so far is comparable uh, or better than most reports that uh, you get from a private source. So I think the communities would, would benefit greatly by having this service. Bruce Tallin, a dairy farmer and entrepreneur from Monticello, developed a new product for milking parlors that allows dairy farmers to get the right amount of feed to the right cows at the right time. Well, I'm pretty confident that if I hadn't been able to get uh, together with the staff at the Institute, that I never would have got this thing off the ground. The decisions are often difficult and hard to make alone. Northern Iowa's Institute for Decision Making is here to help free of charge. Lottery Money at Work in Iowa is creating new jobs and helping businesses through Northern Iowa's Institute for Decision Making. Welcome back to Halftime. I'm Bob Healy along with Mike Pace. It is 41-37. The Panthers on top by four. Hope you're one of the folks that have picked up a couple thousand dollars. There are $105,000 given away in all. But this is not the only time you see this guy at the basketball games at UNI. You've got a son playing for the Panthers now as well. Nick. I sure do, Bob. Uh, my boy is a sophomore, 6'10", backup center, and uh, hasn't seen any action tonight, but I know his... Uh, He'd give anything to be able to play, but he'd, he'd probably give more to see his win. He's gotten his teeth uh, cut on some uh, top-notch competition, though. He saw some action against Georgetown. He, is, he has played some. He's a big kid, 6'10", who's still growing. Well, he's a classic late bloomer, I guess. Uh, a rather immature kid physically, but he gained 20-some pounds this summer. He's getting a lot stronger, and we, we hope that he'll be able to step in there next year and do some good things. This is great, this whole event, isn't it? What's your reaction to the, the hoopla we've had here so I'll far? tell you what, this is absolutely fabulous for the state of Iowa. It really is. Uh, and I think you have to congratulate uh, the University of Iowa and Coach Tom Davis for helping this to happen because it does give the Panthers the opportunity to be on kind of an equal status in terms of home court advantage with the other teams in the state and uh, obviously we're up to it. I guess everybody knows who you're pulling for right now. That's right. <laughs> I, I was, uh, Dr. Stanick said to try to be very neutral. I didn't do anything but purple socks tonight so I'm doing my best. Purple socks, all right. I don't know if we can get those on camera but uh, thanks, thanks a Thank lot. Thank you, man. Bob. All right, 41-37, our score at half. We'll be back with some halftime stats and more. You're watching you and I Basketball on the Iowa Television Network. Experience the rush of time and space. Enter a new dimension of big bucks. The jackpot zone. B. Richardson entered the zone by winning a cool million. Mike Frost, $2.7 million. 
and Steve Heimer busted into the zone by winning nine and a half million dollars. Go to your Iowa Lottery retailer. Your next stop, the jackpot zone. Wednesday's Lotto America jackpot is 13 million dollars. It's that time of year when grown-ups have more secrets than children. And every child is an angel for a week or so. But more than anything, it's a time of hope. Hope for our families, our future, and hope that we've been good for goodness sake. Dreaming of making your home just the right size with a new family room, a larger kitchen, or another bath? Maybe you've had your eye on a new car, a family vacation, or a cruise on a little yacht of your own. If you know what you want, come see us. We'll give you 24-hour notice of approval, a half percent rate reduction with automatic payment from one of our checking accounts, and a large selection of repayment plans. We're all you need to know about loans. We're American Federal. Dreaming of making your home just the right size with a new family room, a larger kitchen, or another bath? Maybe you've had your eye on a new car, a family vacation, or a cruise on a little yacht of your own. If you know what you want, come see us. We'll give you 24-hour notice of approval, a half percent rate reduction with automatic payment from one of our checking accounts, and a large selection of repayment plans. We're all you need to know about loans. We're American Federal. Not too many folks have left their seats for halftime. They are ready to see some basketball. What a first half. I was concerned, guys, that this game would not live up to all the advanced billing. Boy, was I wrong. Great game so far. It's like, a, it's like a Super Bowl that lived up to its advanced billing, and I, I think everybody's excited. I think that even the Iowa fans are excited that you and I is on top at yeah. this juncture. It is uh, what you expected, Mac. You know you and I had the crowd behind them when we started the ballgame, bolted out to that early lead. Iowa has come back, but yet... Panthers have held on to a four-point lead. I think you've really got to go look at the off-court leaders. And the off-court leaders, Tom Davis and Elder Miller. Elder Miller has his team well prepared. And at home, as you indicated, a lot of hype. More Iowa kids, home natives, on that UNI squad. They're really up for it. Bob, when you were doing sports back here five years ago, could you imagine this happening at that point, that you and I would come that far? Well, I, I didn't think they'd come this far this quickly. I, I was there when they beat uh, Drake in Wisconsin yeah. and Kansas State. And they got crowds of 5,000, and that was neat. You and I came to, to prominence then. They're even bigger big time now. All right, we'll take a look at some halftime stats in just a moment. You're watching you and I basketball on ITN. Back with more. Students at the University of Northern Iowa talk about the Northern Iowa Advantage. It's a really nice campus. It's not too big and it's not too small. You're going to meet a lot of people. If you want to be an accounting major, you're probably not going to find a university that has a more qualified faculty than the University of Northern Iowa. When you are reading in those educational journals and you come across the person who wrote that article and you said, I had this person for a professor, that's really neat. The University of Northern Iowa is really growing in all the athletics. The basketball program is definitely growing. It's just a super environment. I also was, you know, thought of going to the bigger schools, but you and I has the number one school of music in Iowa. This is a real feather in you and I's cap to have a system like this because I don't think there are any other schools this size that have a motion analysis system. The Northern Iowa Advantage is part of our pledge to provide quality undergraduate education. Let's take a look at those first half stats. Uh, you and I rebounding very well early in the ballgame, Mac. It'd be interesting to see if they can keep it up in the second half. Well, you really look, everything's pretty equal. You just go right down the line. You look at field goal percentage. You look at free throws. I always had a, a better percentage. But you and I had another opportunity. Rebounds about even. Iowa has started to take the lead. Iowa, though, surprisingly, they've got more turnovers, and they're not facing the pressure. And there's the individual scoring as Muhlenberg, I think, has really been the difference in this ballgame, although McCullough not being intimidated, scoring in double figures as well. Turner doing a tremendous job. Three-point scoring has been good. You saw that you and I was three of seven. Muhlenberg uh, hitting a couple out there as well. So you and I just looking very strong and not intimidated in the first half. Scoring for Iowa, Thompson with 10, Moses 7, Jepson 8. Nobody really in foul trouble for either team at this point. 
And I don't think there's any surprises as you look at who the team leaders are as far as scoring opportunities. It may be the team that finds that fourth score, somebody that hasn't had the good first half that ends up getting hot the second half, they become the team winner. One thing that we have to bring up uh, as we take a look at a, at a replay for the first half is the fact that you and I trailed Georgetown by just three at halftime, pulled it within one in the first three minutes of the second half, and then just got blown away. Now here's Jepson with a slam dunk early, and he was pumped. <laughs> you know, you have to wonder, though, just as you said, about that intensity level, also about physically with the fast-paced ball game that we've been watching. Does you and I have enough bodies to run with Iowa? Tom Davis has run 10, 11 people into this ball game in the first half. I don't think there's any question. The Panthers have tried to do that. They have got the depth this year. They could go 10 deep, and I think Elder Miller has a lot of faith and confidence. And it can be shown by the fact that he puts Cam Johnson, the true freshman in there, who had not been expected to play a lot at the beginning of the year. Do you make any adjustments at this point from what has worked really for both teams, only a four-point difference in the scoring? Do you make any adjustments if you're Iowa or you and I as you come out in the second half, or do you just take it as it happens? I think the overall game plan is going to remain the same. I believe each of the coaches probably have looked and examined maybe one or two plays they felt were very good to them offensively and they will keep those for special occasions when they feel they really need to get something going offensively. Be interesting to see if Iowa works the, any of the, 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 the backdoor lobs or something like that that have, that have worked well for Tom Davis clubs in the past. I, I think they've got the great athletes, the great leapers and we'll see if we see some of those kind of plays. Biggest crowd ever at UNI before tonight, 10,500 back in 1987. You take a look at the stands, they are filled to the rafters. 22-9 is what they're expecting. Probably squeeze in a few more along the way. Yeah, I think there's a couple pair of binoculars up there somewhere, too. And surprisingly, few poor seats. Oh, yeah, it's great. The people right behind us probably have the worst seats in the house. <laughs> a lot of floor well, seats. Who wants to look here? at the back of you? <laughs> Boom. Here is Tom Brokaw. Good evening. The White House is announcing that President Bush momentarily is expected to make an announcement from the White House, and we believe that he will say that General Manuel Noriega is now in custody of the United States. There has been speculation building all day long and some helicopter activity tonight around the Vatican Embassy in Panama City. At the same time, uh, Lawrence Eagleburger, who's the number two man at the State Department, has spent the last 24 hours or so in Panama, and his mission officially was described as taking a look at the future of the economic activity there, but it was widely believed that he was down arranging for the release of Noriega to U.S. officials. Noriega, of course, has been indicted on drug running charges in this country, and he is expected to stand trial here if he is brought to the United States. At the same time tonight, there is an unusually heavy contingent of U.S. federal marshals that have been assembled at Homestead Air Force Base, which is in South Florida. Noriega, you'll recall, went into the sanctuary of the Vatican Embassy in Panama City a week ago Sunday on Christmas Eve after eluding American officials for several days following the U.S. invasion of that small Central American country. He has been there since that time in a room, we're told, by himself. Today, a church official described him as being tired and depressed. At the same time, outside the papal uh, nuncio today, he could no doubt hear an assembled crowd of some 10 to 20,000 Panamanians who are shouting that he now be brought to justice. So we'll be back with the president as soon as he appears from the White House with this unfolding and dramatic story tonight. For now, I'm Tom Brokaw, NBC News in New York. This has been an NBC News special report. We now join our regularly scheduled program already in progress. Hey, hi Moses. It wasn't quite that fast, but he got it down. Back to live action, Jason Reese taken into the hole, had the ball knocked away. But you know what they talked about at halftime now. Reese, you're taken into the hole for you and I. As far as I was concerned, get it to Ray Thompson. Mullenberg trying to get it in. In trouble, throws it right into the hands of James Moses. Three on one break. Thompson loses the basketball. Turner tries to save it, and he does to Reese. Fife on the break. Count it. No question of whether Fife and Reese can get down the floor. They were flying down there. Great pass. And Fife showing great body control before he got fouled. The only regret Steve Fife has is that he didn't jam this one on the other end because he loves to fly out on the break. A tough situation. I was not able to convert at one end. 
and then they turn right around and give up the opportunity at the other continuation. Fife gets the bucket, but not the free throw. They'll give the ball to Iowa. And Joey Sylvester said, now I saw it. We may have a may have a change. Eldon's pointing the other way. The official underneath will give the ball back to you and I. Hollenberg will take it. The officials conferring, and now they're going to jump it. And that means Iowa. Iowa. That means Iowa will get the basketball. Well, that's a rookie Big Ten official, Mike Smith, underneath the basket. Joey Sylvester made the call from outside. Sylvester draws Big Ten as well as Big East games. Mullenberg on Skinner. Panthers by two, 43-41. Ingram down low inside. They go to Jetson. He's fouled. And that's Reese. He's picked up his third. Couple quick ones early. Elder looking at the rest, rest of his bench. Really take Reese out of there. Yeah, he's gonna. Bob in the inbound. Jepson, we walk. Made a move in the bucket. He traveled. Now you're going to see Eldon Miller substitute for Reese. He'll bring Brad Hill into the ball game. Jason Reese going out with three fouls. Shades of the Iowa State game where he battled inside with Victor Alexander and was gone before it was over. You and I answered a charge by Iowa early in the first half. Be interesting to see if they do so this time. Turner finds Wallenberg. He's deadly from there. This one's short. Gets his own rebound. And they'll call a block. The block will go against Ingram. There's one subtle change after halftime. Elder Miller in the first half. Coach from the front of the bench. Now he's on top of the floor. You see Mullenberg missed the shot. No block out. Mullenberg says, I'll go get it myself, which he does time and time again. Gets that rebound. Turner will bring it back out on top. Still a two-point lead for the Panthers. They led by four and a half. Hill with the turnaround jumper. Fife with the rebound, puts it back in. Great jumper, Steve Fife. A tremendous position on that particular play. Fife now with nine, and the lead is back to four. Thompson shakes loose. Great play by Hill to slap it away. Thompson wanted the call. Turner pushes it up. Finds an opening. Goes up to three. Hill keeps it alive, and the Panthers are hitting the boards. They sure are. They're matching him body for body. Mullenberg, I'd look for him to take advantage of that matchup with Skinner at 5'10", trying to guard Mullenberg at 6'5". Yeah, but you, want, you don't want to force a shot. McCullough misses. And now Skinner pushes it across. Moses knocked away by five. And now Thompson will pick up the foul, trying to go for the steal. That is two on Ray Thompson. I'll tell you, Tom Davis wants his players when they go inside to do some pump faking. Especially a shorter man, Moses, just 6'4", comes in to challenge a 6'9 player. You want to plant yourself, pump fake, get him up in the air, try and draw that foul. Those are the exact two words that Davis yelled at him. Pump fake. He's a great teacher, Tom Davis is. Fife has it knocked by away by Earl. Look at the smile on Earl's face after that block. <laughs> Thompson pulls Iowa within one, a three, 45-44. Lukenville reaching in, and Lukenville has just about got a T right there. He hasn't liked one call against him this game. Intense competitor from Fort Dodge. Panthers will take it out of bounds on the side. Just a one-point game, 45-44. McCullough looking for an opening. Takes it up at Earl. He may have got a piece of that one. He did. He definitely knew Earl was there. That's why he pumped. Thompson, two in a row, same spot. Earl with the jam the other end. And Jepson now goes to the board. Guys on top now. Stepping up that pressure. 
Took him 25 minutes to do it, but the Hawkeyes have taken the lead. McCullough. Back out to Turner. It's a three. In and out. That really hurt. Heartbreak shot. Garner inside to Earl. And Brad Hill will pick up the foul. Brad Hill was thought to be that junior college transfer that could come in, be an athlete, and really give you and I some strong play off the bench. He has had one or two good games, but been inconsistent. He's a player that can play all five positions on the court. Jonathan Cox now back in for the Panthers. Moses shakes free inside, slapped away. Two on one break. Hill goes to the hoop and puts it down. And the Panthers go back on top by one. They've met the charge so far. You've got to admire that. They're not folding the tent. And this is with Jason Reese on the bench with three fouls. Ingram, right corner. They're looking still to post up inside to Moses. Earl. Just nice. too big a body inside. Nice drive by Michael Ingram. That's something you don't see out of Michael very often, the dribble drive. Also nice for the Hawkeyes to get the points to Earl. That almost loses it. That's a three from Hill. Yes! Three. Great Back. ball game. Look at that rebound. Long outlet pass to McCullough. He slides almost off the court. Can't catch up to it. He was open for a minute. The pass just too far. Well, Bob and Bob, I'd have to say the same thing. I was just thinking, what a great fans <laughs> game. <laughs> hope, yeah. you, hope you're enjoying it at home. We've got a timeout. Two-point lead for the Panthers. 50-48. How about this ball game? Back with more on ITN. Looks like a pound, it feels like a sneaker. Looks like a pound, it feels like a sneaker. New shockproof, painproof, Easy Spirit dress pumps with the same insides as the Easy Spirit sneaks. Looks like a pound, it feels like a sneaker. Easy Spirit dress. Shall we walk? Where can I get them? You find it in promises, and you find it in plans, in the midst of laughter, and in silences shared. When the deal is sealed, and when the dance is done, it's there. And for 80 million responsible Americans, it's simply a good part of the good life. It's beer. A message from Budweiser. Take a look at this transition game. First, the block on one end, then Mullenberg on the break. Ahead to Hill, he goes in for the bucket. Brad Hill, somebody, the Panthers just waiting to break out and have a big ball game, score 25, 30 points. He said at half, look for a fourth player, somebody new to come in and have a good second half. Hawkeye shooting 63% in the second half. The Panthers have gotten 12 shots, but only made a third of them, 33% of this half. Fifty forty-eight. You and I buy two. There's the battle of the doors. Moses went on the stepped on the end line as he went to the dribble. He can't believe the call, but it was a good one. Cox splits that Iowa pressure. Cam Johnson, the freshman, now in along with Cox. Spike. Troy Mullenberg and Hill. Jason Reese still sitting on the sideline with three fouls. Mullenberg oh, shakes free in the corner. Now back out on top. Cox not really one to look for the shot. The freshman Cam Johnson has not looked for the shot either today. Mullenberg from downtown gets his own rebound. How many times has he done that today? He does it his whole career. He just follows his shot brilliantly. Great pass. Oh. Ingram will pick up that foul. Ingram throws bodies everywhere. He thought it should have gone against Fife, but Michael Ingram gets the foul going for the rebound. A lot of aggressive bodies in this game. Garner giving it up. Thompson making the athletic ability, trying to get the free throw. And then the foul underneath. You got two fouls taking place there. 
Steve Fife wanted an intentional foul. He put his wrists across and said two-shot foul. He thought it was intentional. And, and Michael is Ingram down. is down. There you see the edge of that court drops off about three inches before it goes to the backing. He may or may not have hit that, but appears to have injured that right knee. John Street, the Iowa trainer, goes over along with Tom Davis. They've already got Matt Bullard on the bench waiting to come back from his knee injury. What a blow it would be for this one. Apparently Matt Bullard might be ready for that Saturday game against Ohio State. He was out uh, running through plays is, is probably the best thing to, to say, but he hasn't done any contact work at this point. Ingram being helped off. He's had surgery, major surgery, on that left leg you see wrapped up so heavily. It appears to be the right knee that he's favoring. Matt Bullard said he thought he was ready to play tonight if needed. He, he, he'd go in. Let's put it that way. I don't think there's any question. He said, Coach Davis, I get to be started tonight, don't I? <laughs> Coach Davis said, you better talk to the doctor, son. Steve Fyre, and I think it really is going to come down to when he gets full range of motion back in that knee. You can feel good, but you've got to understand what movement a knee has to make on a basketball court. Steve Fife at the line for two. The senior from Nashua, Iowa, transfer from Oral Roberts. He's got 10 now, hits double figures. That's a three-point lead for the Panthers. Look at Jepson swing those elbows. One of these days, he's going to get called for it. I think the crowd agreed with you here. The UNI people started to boo. And it's the first time I think we've seen UNI in a zone. Elder Miller has said he likes to play zone when he wants to change the tempo of a basketball game. Ball still alive. Lookingville comes up with it. Put a new 45 on the shot clock. Well, Net. credit Earl for getting that ball back because he tipped the ball off the board, reaching in. The second time tonight, the exact same spot, just about Lookingville loses the basketball, this time at the other end of the court. Tom Davis can't believe it, right through his hands. Jepson right in your face, that'll, that'll scare you, huh? You know who Jepson reminds me of? Uh, Mac, you may remember this player who played for you and I almost a decade ago, Ray Stork. Yeah. Very, very, very similar. Johnson inbounds to Turner. 13.45 left, 51.48. The Panthers by three. Bullenberg. Inside the five, over A.C. Earl, another block. Moses back the other way, tries to take it coast to coast, and Cam Johnson gets called for the foul, reaching in. That's what Moses has got to do a little bit better. Court awareness. He had three white shirts ahead of him. Look, there isn't a black shirt near it. Trail in the play. Three white shirts ahead of him. You've got to just stop and wait for a trailer. Four team fouls against the Panthers. Six against you and I. Moses inside the land of the Giants. Puts it down. A good great seal. inside position. Yeah. Good seal off by the Iowa Hawkeyes inside. Allowing Moses just to go straight up. His teammates were around him. One point you and I lead. 51-50. Hill breaking the pressure. Finds Turner to five. Jeff give the credit to Dale Turner. Great feed to the baseline. That's right. He made A.C. Earl commit. Earl was thinking he was going to get another block. He didn't get it. Fife checking the clock right now, which says 12.52, and the Panthers up by three. Boy, the intensity on the Panther faces. Tells all the story of this one. Could be the biggest game in the... This is an NBC News special report. Here is Tom Brokaw. Good evening. President Bush is expected in the White House press briefing room momentarily to officially announce that General Manuel Noriega is now in American custody and headed for the United States where he is expected to be put on trial on drug trafficking charges. NBC News has learned that General Noriega left the Papal Nuncio this evening, not so long ago. He walked unescorted to some awaiting helicopters that lifted off from the Vatican mission there. This was the nighttime scene now in Panama City. We believe that one of those helicopters does in fact contain General Manuel Noriega. Uh, there is a military news conference scheduled in Panama City momentarily as well, but the commander of chief, of course, takes precedent in this case. It was on December 20th that the United States forces invaded Panama. Noriega went instantly into hiding. We later learned that he spent most of that time in Panama City itself moving among the homes of his friends and including his mistress's mother. 
And then, of course, on Christmas Eve, he turned himself in to the papal nuncio and asked for political sanctuary. That was a week ago Sunday. He's been there ever since. The United States has been in intense negotiations with the Vatican in Rome and with the papal officials in Panama City trying to arrange for some kind of a release of Noriega. Today, crowds of Panamanians, many of them dressed in the traditional white now, the political opposition gathered outside the papal nuncio and demanded that he be brought to justice. Last week, the United States engaged in what was described by army officials as a form of psychological warfare until the Vatican began to protest the loud booming of rock and roll music on a 24-hour basis. Noriega, if he is brought to this country, as we now expect that he will be, and incidentally tonight, at Homestead Air Force Base, which is in South Florida, there is a large gathering, we're told, of federal marshals. NBC's Brian Ross has been watching the activity there all night. It would be the logical place to bring him. It is the uh, southernmost Air Force Base that the United States has on the mainland, as you can see. It's down there in uh, Dade County, I think Homestead is. It's where President Nixon used to fly in and out of as he went to his uh, retreat on Key Biscayne. At any rate, we do expect that Noriega will be brought to an American military installation, most likely tonight, to Homestead Air Force Base. And when he gets to this country, if he is put on trial, he does face a wide variety of charges, primarily on drug trafficking. But Noriega has been an employee of the United States. That is, he worked for the CIA, when he was head of intelligence for the Panamanian National Guard. NBC's John Cochran at the White House now. Isn't there some fear, John, that Noriega, in fact, could go on a stand and talk about his role in the Iran-Contra affair when the money that was supposed to go back to the United States was used to smuggle arms to the Contras? Well, President Bush says not. He says it's all past history. He says he's not afraid of any of his secrets coming out. I've talked to his aides privately. They say they're not worried, so we'll just have to see what Noriega has got or claims to have later on. One thing Noriega, you know, has been uh, reported as having uh, said uh, in the Vatican Embassy recently is that he would come out only if he got one a fair trial in the U.S. and two, that he were not subject to the death penalty. The White House today said, well, of course he would get a fair trial. Anybody uh, tried in the United States uh, will be offered a fair trial trial, and two, Noriega is not being tried on any capital punishment charges. So they tried to put that fear out of his mind. Uh, we've had these reports, of course, the White House has had these reports, that Noriega is depressed. Uh, the White House seems to think a lot of its information is somewhat second-hand. There have been reports that Noriega has been deprived of his drug supply, that he's a drug addict. The White House says it has no firm intelligence that Manuel Noriega is indeed a drug addict. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence that he's a casual drug user, but whether drugs play a part in all of this, we just don't know, John, Tom. John, John Cochran, thank you very much. We have additional details now. We have been told, NBC News has learned, that Noriega, once he got on board those helicopters, was taken to Howard Air Force Base, just outside of Panama City. He has now left Panama. He is en route to the United States, and that is the announcement that we expect from President Bush momentarily. At the same time, at the Vatican Embassy in Panama City, a priest has confirmed what we told you just moments ago, that Manuel Noriega voluntarily gave himself up to U.S. authorities, and he walked unescorted, we're told, through the night to a waiting U.S. helicopter where he was taken, we believe, if not in this helicopter, in another one that was uh, parked just outside. We saw this activity earlier this evening. We see a group of people, as you can see, gathered around the helicopter. This was taken in our special nighttime scope and we believe that that is the helicopter in which Noriega is board boarded not so long ago taken to Howard Air Force Base and then of course transferred to an American plane that will take him to the United States and we have been told now that he has left Panama that he is en route here we have standing by on the telephone I think Dan Molina of NBC News who is in Panama City Dan earlier today Tens of 20, uh, 10 to 20,000 Panamanians, I, I gather from the crowd estimates, were demanding that he be brought to justice. Do you think that the crowd knew that this thing was about to be resolved? I would think that they did, Tom. It was an extraordinary sight through the afternoon. Uh, there was news that a demonstration was to be held, and then news that the Vatican Embassy had asked that it not be held. But nonetheless, people kept on coming, and the thousands and thousands of them accumulated down there. And you could tell just from the way that they acted that there was certainly an air of expectation. I must say that right now we are seeing an extraordinary phenomenon here in, in Panama City. Uh, from here and there and all over the city as we...
stand on our 16th floor balcony looking out over the city, we can hear those pots and pans start to clang here and there from one building, then another building, apartment houses all around here. People know what's going on, and there, there is an air of celebration certainly emerging here. But that must be on some kind of a verbal network because it's my impression at least that you haven't heard anything officially there on Panamanian radio and television, although they do get American television down there. Is that where they're getting their information? That is certainly the case, Tom. Yes, it's certainly a word of mouth that is getting this around right now. The activity outside the Vatican Embassy has been so evident this evening, though, I must say. There have been extraordinary numbers of helicopters coming and going. You may be able to hear one in the background right now. Uh, and the... Uh, picture that we saw through a night lens that we have of uh, three people walking out of the front gate of the Vatican Embassy. Uh, news of that, which happened about an hour ago, quickly spread around here. It takes no time at all for these things to get from person to person here. And what has been the reaction in the last couple of days as you have watched the Panamanians and how they deal with the United States? Great relief that there is an occupational army there? Oh, no doubt about that, Tom. As a matter of fact, one of the first nights yeah. I was here, uh, I rode around Dan, with one of the joint Dan, US Dan, 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 Mo yeah. Dan Molina, I'm sorry, we're going to go now to the White House where Marlon Fitzwater has taken the podium. We, of course, could not be sure that it would actually occur. President Bush remained in the residence until Secretary Cheney called him at approximately 9 o'clock this evening to say that General Noriega was in our custody. The president immediately came to the Oval Office to work on remarks, which he will be presenting to you in just a few minutes. I'll give you a two-minute warning in just a second. The president will not take questions following his statement, but General Maxwell Thurman, commander of Southcom, will hold a briefing in Panama on the details of the situation. General Thurman's briefing will follow the president's statement very soon. We'll be right back. notified. Marlon Fitzwater, who's the president's spokesman, saying that uh, Mr. Bush at this hour is in the uh, White House Oval Office or in that uh, private retreat that he has just off to the side, working on remarks after having been notified at 9 p.m. tonight, that's uh, just about 40 minutes ago now, by Defense Secretary Dick Cheney, that General Manuel Noriega is in American custody, as we have been reporting throughout the evening here on NBC. Apparently, he gave himself up voluntarily, and he walked to the awaiting helicopters. When he comes to this country, we're told now that the president will be with us in just two minutes, so if you'll stand by. When he comes to this country, Noriega is expected to be put on trial on a wide variety of charges, including protecting cocaine shipments flown from Colombia through Panama to the United States, arranging the shipment and the sale of chemicals used to process that cocaine, providing refuge in a base to members of the Colombian cocaine cartel, and of course for all that he is expected, that is, it is believed that he has amassed an enormous fortune. He has homes, we're told, in the Dominican Republic, possibly in Paris as well. And everyone thinks that he has uh, secret uh, bank accounts in Switzerland where he has squirreled away a great deal of money. Whether he'll have access to that for his legal defense, we cannot say. NBC's John Cochran is at the White House now. John, what do we know? Well, we know that uh, this time, I'm not sure you quite picked up that, uh, all of that briefing from Marlon Fitzwater a little while ago, the president's spokesman. Apparently, about 6 o'clock this evening, the president was advised by his national security advisor, Brent Scowcroft, that Noriega wanted to make a deal. So that's only a little more than three and a half hours ago. The deal apparently was cut within a three-hour time period because uh, Fitzwater says that the president was informed by Defense Secretary Cheney around 9 o'clock that, in fact, the deal had been struck. So uh, a lot of fast-moving developments tonight. I can tell you as late as about 5.30 Eastern standard time tonight uh, white house people here were saying we have no evidence of a deal there were lots of rumors floating around panama city we floated most of these rumors past the press office here and with other officials in the white house and they said we honestly don't know and i think they were telling the truth at that point tom thank you very much john cochran president bush if you're just joining us is expected at the white house press briefing room podium momentarily he has completed his remarks by now to make the announcement to the country the General Manuel Noriega now is in U.S. custody. We believe that he has left Panamanian airspace, that he is headed for the United States. It's about a three-hour flight. Here now is the President of the United States. Well, on Wednesday, December 20th, I ordered U.S. troops to Panama with four objectives. To safeguard the lives of American citizens, to help restore democracy, to protect the integrity of the Panama Canal Treaties, and to bring uh, General Manuel Noriega to justice. All of these objectives have now been achieved. 
At about 8.50 this evening, General Noriega turned himself in to U.S. authorities in Panama with the full knowledge of the Panamanian government. He was taken to Howard Air Force Base in Panama, where he was arrested by DEA. A U.S. Air Force C-130 is now transporting General Noriega to Homestead Air Force Base, Florida. He will be arraigned in the U.S. District Court in Miami on charges stemming from his previous indictment for drug trafficking. I want to thank the Vatican and the Papal Nuncio in Panama for their even-handed, statesmanlike assistance in recent days. The United States is committed to providing General Noriega a fair trial. Nevertheless, his apprehension and return to the United States should send a clear signal that the United States is serious in its determination that those charged with promoting the distribution of drugs cannot escape the scrutiny of justice. The return of Gen General Noriega marks a significant milestone in Operation Just Cause. The U.S. used its resources in a manner consistent with political, diplomatic, and moral principles. The first U.S. combat troops have already been withdrawn from Panama. Others will follow as quickly as the local situation will permit. We are now engaged in the final stages of a process that includes the economic and political revitalization of this important friend and neighbor, Panama. An economic team under the direction of Deputy Secretary of State Eagleburger and Deputy Secretary of Treasury Robson is just returning from Panama. A team of experts has remained on hand there to assess the full range of needs. We will continue to extend to the Panamanian people our support and assistance in the days ahead. Panamanians, Americans both, has sacrificed much to restore democracy to Panama. The armed forces of the United States have performed their mission courageously and effectively, and I again want to express my gratitude and appreciation to all of them. And I want to express the special thanks of our nation to those servicemen who were wounded and to the families of those who gave their lives. Their sacrifice has been a noble cause and will never be forgotten. A free and prosperous Panama will be an enduring tribute. Thank you all very, very much. No, no strings, no, no deals, no deals, Mr. President. No deals? President Bush not taking questions after making his announcement in the White House press briefing room that in fact General Manuel Noriega is in U.S. custody. He is en route to the United States. He is expected to land at Homestead Air Force Base in Florida probably sometime just before midnight or shortly thereafter based on our calculations of how long it should take to get there, about three hours of the flight from Panama. He gave himself up voluntarily, we were told earlier, NBC News has learned that from sources uh, both within the administration and then a Vatican priest uh, in Panama City said that he walked uh, unescorted to the uh, helicopters that took him to Howard Air Force Base tonight and then he was transferred to that C-130. The president praised the Vatican and the papal nuncio for its statesmanlike ways and its even-handed approach to all of this. He said it sends a clear signal as well that the United States is serious about dealing with those who are responsible for funneling drugs into this country. The president also praised, of course, the Americans who were involved in the invasion and his, he expressed uh, his support and sympathy to those families of those uh, young men who were killed, 23 altogether. This is what uh, General Noriega faces in federal court. He is expected to be arraigned in Miami. He has already been indicted both in Tampa and in Miami to repeat the charges against him protecting the cocaine shipments, also for arranging the shipment and the sale of chemicals used to process that cocaine, providing refuge and a base to members of the Colombian cocaine cartel. If convicted on, on all counts, Noriega could receive a maximum of one, 145 years in jail and more than a million dollars in fines. We're I think everyone in Iowa should come to Grinnell 